All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Deborah Berry. I'm the administrator with Your Home Health Care. Um, I've been an OASIS uh, C2, well, I've been an OASIS certified clinician since the inception of OASIS and um, done these presentations a few times to help people understand the intent of the questions and the guidelines and, and things of that nature. So the purpose of this presentation is not to go through every OASIS question. That would take uh, several days to do that. So it's just going to give you an overview of the questions that impact our star ratings, our reimbursement, and those that changed back uh, in 2017, in January of 2017, we had a revision of our OASIS assessment. Okay, so the goals of the presentation are to provide the clinician with the working knowledge of the conventions and intent of the OASIS questions, enhance the knowledge and practice of the clinician, in the area of quality patient outcomes, understand the importance of home health star ratings. So what is an OASIS assessment? OASIS stands for Outcome Assessment Information Set. And basically it is designed for a couple of different purposes. It, the OASIS is, the design, is designed to measure the patient's outcomes. So that's how we get our star ratings. And if you don't know much about star ratings or you're not familiar with home health, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but but in a nutshell, that's how we're measured as far as the quality of our outcomes are. It measures the patient's condition between two time points, which is your start of care and your transfer, or your start of care and your um, discharge. It measures quality against patient's outcomes. Patient risk factors are also taken into consideration. Remember, the OASIS is really a data collection tool that CMS has created to measure our, our outcomes and our quality, but it also provides us with our reimbursement. So based on, um, depending on the diagnosis and the answers that we answer to certain questions, we'll determine what our HERG score is, which determines what our reimbursement is. They have taken this data collection set and incorporated it into a nursing assessment which means that a lot of the questions won't make sense to you as a clinician. So if you can remember that this is a data collection and a payment tool and a tool to measure outcomes, then that might help you get over some of those hurdles as a clinician. So the only people that can collect OASIS are the RN, the PT, and the ST. The OT can do it, but not at the start of care. And according to our policy, so our policy, we only use RNs, our trained physical therapists, to collect OASIS data. And we have currently two on staff with us that do that. So your paraprofessionals are not allowed to collect OASIS data. You may hear LVNs, I've heard them say, yeah, well, I used to do OASIS. They're not supposed to. They should have never done that. <laughs> and that might have been the time before everybody really quite understood what was going on with it. So star ratings, what's a big deal about star rating? Well, agencies are given a star rating based on the quality of patient care. Our ratings range from one to five. Uh, some referral sources will not refer a patient to you unless you have a minimum of three stars, which thankfully uh, we do have a three star star rating. Um, physicians are referring patients to agency with the best star rating. So it, this is put out there on um, Home Health Compare. You can go on to Home Health Compare and look at any home health agency and see what their star ratings are. And it's very easy to do. So people that are referring patients to home health, a lot of them do that. You know, a lot of our ortho groups are looking at the star ratings to see what are the outcomes. And your assessment is going to determine what our star ratings are. So some of the things that create the star rating is process of care measures. So how often um, the agency's patient went to an inpatient care in a timely manner. How, we, how did we provide um, drug education? Did we do that timely? Did we ensure that the patient had a flu vaccine? Some out, outcome of care measures are, did the patient get better walking and moving around? So they're measuring our ambulation. They're measuring transfers, bathing, um, pain. Or is the patient's pain decreasing? What about their shortness of breath? And the other big one is their rehospitalizations. They're looking at our patients that go back into the hospital within 60 days. And if they do, then that does not uh, bode well for us on our star ratings. Our star ratings decrease. The other big one that we look at a lot real closely is how quickly are we getting in there? We have 48 hours 
to see a patient from the time that we get the referral or the time that we find out that they've discharged from the hospital, unless the doctor orders something different. Now, we all know that, you know, it's not always available to get out there in 48 hours. Sometimes our patients don't want us to come, you know, and in that situation, we're going to go ahead and call the doctor um, and our case managers in the office will do that for you and get orders to move the start of care date. It should be on your yellow sticky in Kinzer as to when that final referral was and, and when um, we completed it. So just because you see a date that we got clinicals on a patient, we may not have a following doctor. So it's not a complete referral until we get a following doctor. So that's when you see some discrepancies in those dates. So the importance of your accuracy in your OASIS helps to assure that our star ratings reflect the quality of care that we're providing. And so it helps the better, we've seen the better that we assess and accurately assess the patients, our star ratings do improve. And it also helps to assure that we have accurate reimbursement. Remember, you know, our, our HER rating is based on the stars and based on our assessment. And so if we're underscoring our patients, then we receive less monies. So an example would be um, if your patient had a wound and we just didn't document, you know, that they had a wound in the in, in questions, then we wouldn't get reimbursed for um, all the supplies related to that wound. And so you understand the way, way home health works is that it's a bundled payment. So they're looking at the acuity level of your patient and they're saying, well, based on the diagnosis, your acuity level and everything you scored here, we think it's going to take this much money to take care of the patient. And so that's how we're paid. So if we miss little things like wounds, which aren't little, but if we miss documenting the wound, then we miss our whole supply reimbursement. So that's why it's really important for accurate reimbursement. And it also reflects our improved quality of care. You know, we don't want to um, not take credit for the little things that we do. And we're going to talk a, a little bit more later on. How do you take credit for the little things you do? Um, and the items that are used to calculate the case mix. You'll see, you'll hear case mix, her reimbursement. Those three words used interchangeably. It's all the same thing. It, it just means how much are you going to get paid. So episode of timing, whether it's early or late, that's going to determine how much you get paid. There's nothing we can do about that. And we try to get it right, but really that's not a real big deal because Medicare knows if they're early or late and they always adjust it on the back end. But that does impact how much they pay us. The other ones that impact how much they pay us are ICD-10 codes. Now, this is a really big deal because um, we want to be as specific as possible on these codes. When you're writing your clinical summary and you're talking about how you're growing out and we're admitting the patient to home health service, one of the first sentences on there should be, um, we're admitting the patient for. And what is that primary reason that you're admitting the patient? and that diagnosis, and then the secondary diagnosis, because we outsource our coding, and our coders can only code what you've told them is primary. So you understand that the primary diagnosis should be related to the primary skill. So that means if we have, say, an orthopedic patient, that our therapists are going to be in there twice as much as our nurses, then our primary diagnosis should be related to therapy, okay? And um, if, if, if it's a toss up, you know, sometimes it's an equal amount Then you know, don't don't stress over it. Just put whatever you think might most impact their care. The other thing about codes is certain codes pay more than other codes. Specific codes always pay or generalized codes do not. So, for instance, if your patient has arthritis and you just put generalized arthritis, we don't get reimbursed more than that, more for that code. However, if you put patient has arthritis uh, to the right knee or the left knee, then that specificity of the code increases our reimbursement. Okay, so codes are really important to try to get right. Um, in 10, M1030, therapy, therapy patients receive in the home, so these are infusions, that impacts reimbursement. Their pain, their types of wound, whether they have pressure ulcers, uh, the stage of the pressure ulcer, the stasis ulcer, surgical wounds, uh, shortness of breath, uh, whether they have a catheter, if they're incontinent, their ability to dress, all their ADLs impact reimbursement, their bathing, transferring, toilet transferring, ambulation, and whether or not they need therapies. Now, this is the way Medicare pays um, a home health agency. It's, it's a 60-40 split, which means at the start of care, 
when you get your OASIS back in, we create the 45, we can submit a payment right there for 60% of what our HERG is. And so then they will pay us. And then we get the 40% at the discharge. And so that's why we're always saying, get your stuff in, get your stuff in, get your stuff in, because that holds our money. And, you know, and, and an, a, a co no company can work very long without some capital coming in. <laughs> so um, it's a 60-40 split on Start to Care, and I think it's a 50-40 split on research, which means that research that we do, we can't get reimbursement until we get all of that stuff moving. Um, so therapy, going back to M2200, the reason that one's important, if you, they pay us based on the number of therapy visits, okay? So when you go in and you know it's PTE value, you don't know how many therapy visits they're gonna make. So a lot of times they put 001, which means we get zero reimbursement and we have to wait 60 days to get our therapy reimbursement. So what I've asked everybody to do is if we know therapy is going in, um, typically they're gonna do at least six visits, you know? So I ask everybody to put 006, in M2200 if we even know that they're going in. Now, if they don't do the six visits, Medicare will take the money back at the end. It's not going to be a problem at all. They, they will readjust that. If we do way more than six and it gets into, you know, they have tiers, right? So if it gets into a different tier, then they'll they'll give us that at the end too. They'll fix it at the end. But just historic, historically looking and at our all of our assessments, majority of our patients get at least six visits, if not more, anytime we put a therapist in there. So it just helps make reimbursement a little bit more accurate at the front end. So after going in, it usually takes me a little longer to get mine in, so mm -hmm. I usually look at it, because I can do things usually evaluated, mm -hmm. so I get them in, yeah. and I'm like 13. Now that's and that is absolutely perfect. That's okay. That's really the best way to do it. That's the most accurate way to do it. Not everybody does that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yours is the perfect perfect way. And what Holly said, in case you couldn't hear her, she said a lot of times that by the time she's you know completing her OASIS, therapy has already done their evaluation. So she will look at their level of care and put that exact number. And that's really the perfect way to do it. Okay. Time period or visit under consideration. So you should you should report what is true on the day of assessment unless a different time period is indicated in the item or in the related guidance. So what's the day of assessment? The day of assessment means 24 hours preceding and including the time the assessment was done. So when you go into your patient's home, say at, at 10 o'clock, you also want to assess what happened last night, what happened yesterday afternoon. That's the 24 hour time period. And it makes a difference. You know, you'll see as we talk about ADLs and IADLs and things of that nature, it makes a big difference because sometimes, you know, we're a little bit better at different parts of the day than others. Or what if your patient just came out of the hospital? So they were probably a lot worse, you know, in the hospital and maybe maybe they couldn't get their medications. Maybe they couldn't, you know, ambulate independently, those types of things. And so that that counts because they weren't doing those things independently. So we score them higher than at discharge. We can score them lower. And then that shows improvement. OK, and ask questions anytime. Everybody on the line. Um, I'm on slide 10. <laughs> So other examples of time periods within the last 14 days, a uh, day of assessment and recent pertinent past. That, that time frame when answering a question is only relevant to pain, and we'll talk more about that. It, they talk about payment episodes uh, prior to this current illness, exacerbation, or injury, or since the last OASIS as assessment, but it's a it change. That should be a last start of care or resumption of care assessment, so a correction to that one. So all of the M items refer to the usual status most of the time. Now we're talking about the conventions and guidelines around the specific OASIS questions. So usual status most of the time, unless it says otherwise, right? So what is the patient status often change? So patient statuses often change from day to day or even, or even during a given day. The key to answering the M items correctly is to consider most of the time during the day under consideration. So like we talked about our patient in the hospital, if you go out at 10 in the morning and he didn't get discharged until five the night before, then the majority of his status during that 24 hours was what was going on in the hospital. 
So that's what we're having to assess and ask those questions, not necessarily what you're seeing there at that visit. Um, you also want to find out what's true the majority of the time. So that means greater than 50% of the time. So usual status, most of the time. Um, M2005 medication intervention, we're talking about that goes into the next calendar day, okay? M2301 emergent care. So that's at the time of or any time since the previous OASIS assessment. And you see that on transfers. So the majority of, of what you do, I don't think y'all have ever done a transfer, um, but if you do, you'll see has the patient had emergent care or a discharge, I think. It's really important to read the entire OASIS question. Um, it used to be really very difficult to understand the intent of the OASIS questions. When it first came out, you literally had to sit in a class for two days to understand what are they talking about? What is the intent behind this question? What does it include? What does it exclude? I will have to give them this. Um, since C2's come out, they've done a lot better explaining the intent within the question, but it's still very important to read the entire question to understand what they're talking about. Try to minimize the use of NA or unknown. Um, only use these options when no other response is possible or appropriate. So if a patient refuses to answer, it's not automatically NA or unknown. You'll see as we go through this, some of the answers can be obtained by your clinical judgment. Others can be obtained by your clinical judgment and perhaps the caregiver, you know, things that you've learned about the patient. So don't just automatically use NA if the patient uh, doesn't want to answer. The discharge assessment must be done without reference to the previous val values for any health status item. So this gets pretty tricky when we do dis discharges. And we will talk about this more um, when we get to the slides about discharges. But just keep that in mind that e the, the point of that statement is that really each OASIS needs to stand alone, that it's based on your assessment, not what happened before. Um, OASIS conventions, direct observation is preferred. So assessing psychological or functional status, direct observation is preferred. Combined observation, so interview, and any other relevant strategies can be used to complete items as needed. <laughs> Again, we want you to read the question. Some items rely on interview only, the patient or the caregiver or the primary source for information. And we'll talk more about this, but we want you to understand what's included and excluded in the question, and that's the whole purpose of this um, presentation really is to talk about those specific OASIS questions. What what are we talking about here and what are we excluding? So, um, Deborah, on that last slide where you were talking about based on another assessment, mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure that they understand, um, you know, looking at previous answers doesn't, shouldn't guide your answer there because they may have declined. And we want to see that decline um, mm -hmm. documented when we do our SHP check, so we can intervene and see why they declined and what else we need to do. Absolutely. Because a lot of times nurses says, well, I've been guilty of it too. Didn't really know how I wanted to answer, so I looked to see what they answered last time and kind of based my opinion on that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've learned through all these trainings that that's not always the right answer. Right, right. Robin made a very, very good point in case you couldn't hear um, very well. Her point was is that you want to look at the patient, you want to assess the patient, because even if you feel like the patient's declining, you think they can't be right, they're not supposed to decline, they're only supposed to get better, and you look back and you see, yeah, the patient has declined, it truly may be the right answer, because we do have some very high acuity patients on service that do decline, and then we do transfer over to hospice, or it, it indicates uh, when we look at SHP that maybe we need therapy back in there. You know what's going on with the patient so don't trust your assessment you guys are all skilled clinicians and your assessment skills are just as good as your friend that did the assessment before you so trust yourself I think that's really the the take-home point with that one and answer it based on what you see okay so when you see assistance in a question that means assistance from another person unless it states otherwise, okay? So assistance from another person can mean something as very, as simple as just a verbal cue. You know, simply reminding, hey, don't forget to, to grab your walker or be careful when you step over the rug. That's verbal assistance because had you not been there to say that, then they might not have taken their walker or they might have tripped over the rug. So again, not minimizing the impact of another person. 
Uh, minimal assistance means many of the functional domain responses include the phrase minimal assistance. That's less than, um, okay, so that's an individual assisting the patient is contributing less than 25% of the total effort required to complete the, the task, whether it be a transfer or what have you. And it's hard to determine what percentage is being used if you're not the one doing it. So when you're when you're assessing your patients, ADLs and things of that nature, it's always good for you to be the one to help them because it's a lot easier to determine was that 25% of the effort or more or less. Okay, so back in 2014, um, we had impact act, an Impact Act revision, which Impact Act stands for Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation. So what this did, and this is why we have this new OACC2, it's kind of old now, it's a year old, but this is why they revised it to OACC2, is because they wanted all the providers to have a standardized assessment. So the LTACs, the RIFs, the SNFs, and our home health agencies, they want to be able to improve quality in all post-acute settings, improve transition between care settings, and compare care and outcome in different post-acute care settings. Um, you'll see this, it'll be very interesting because as you know already, all of our OASIS questions start with M except for one, that one GGC or whatever, that came from a, a SNF. And so they've added that to our assessment. So that is a direct correlation to the impact revision. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, OASIS time points. So let's talk about this. Um, the date the assessment is completed, this is your M0090, and we have to complete our OASIS assessment within five days of the start of care. And your completion date may not correspond to your visit date, and that's okay. Um, start of care comprehensive assessment, like I just said, five days after the start of care, a rock. We have 48 hours from the, pa from the time that the patient discharges from the hospital or that we find out that the patient discharged from the hospital. A recertification, it's the last five days of that 60-day episode, including day 60. So it's between day 56 and day 60. We have to do the research. Um, a follow-up for significant change in condition. We have not done that a lot. That's probably something that we will start doing and talking about. But if we see a significant change in the patient's condition, um, and significant is kind of vague, that needs to be defined, you know, through the agency. But if we define that the patient has a significant change, we have 48 hours to go out and do another OASIS assessment. Um, if the patient's transferred to an inpatient facility, so they go to the hospital or something like that, we have 48 hours to do that transfer OASIS from the time that they're transferred or the time that we found out. So a lot of times, well, maybe not a lot of times, but it does happen. People will go out to do their visit and the patient said, yeah, I just got home from the hospital. Well, we have to do a transfer. You know, we have 48 hours and that transfer should be done. And then we have to do a rock. So if it's an RN, you do a transfer and a rock on that visit instead of your skilled nurse visit. Those are fun visits. <laughs> Death at home, 48 hours or when we were made known. And the same is true for discharge from the agency. And, you know, we talked about the disciplines at the start of care that could do an OASIS assessment. Um, we didn't go into that a whole lot. I think I need to back up just a little bit. A nurse has to do the start of care OASIS assessment if that patient has any nursing visits at all. If the patient does not have nursing visits and they're an orthopedic patient, then the therapist can do it. That is the primary therapist. So the physical therapist or the speech therapist. That's only at the start of care. So after the start of care, any discipline can do the OASIS. So if we have nursing and therapy in there, the therapist can do the recertification or the discharge. Okay. Uh, death at home. So if... If uh, somebody died somewhere other than an inpatient, outpatient facility, or the ER, we're going to complete RFA-8, death at home, M0100. So if the patient um, is at home or, in ch or at church in an ambulance, or if they're pronounced dead in the ER, then that's considered um, somewhere other than home, dead, wait, died somewhere other than inpatient, outpatient. So that's considered a death at home. Okay, so if they... 
go to the ER and they're pronounced dead on arrival at the ER. They didn't do any type of resuscitation. They didn't, they didn't do anything for them. Then that's considered a death at home. Now, if they go into the ER and they get some treatment and within a matter of hours they, they die, then that's not a death at home. That's a transfer. How, how do those deaths affect us? I know I did a start of care a few weeks ago, and I think she may have died. How does that affect not, not a lot. It doesn't really affect us a lot. I think that's more for the hospital. You know, so if um, they're DO, DOA at the ER, then it's not a ding on the hospital. It affects the hospital more than it does us. Okay. Yeah, so that's really kind of for the hospital. Um, yeah. Death date, that's the date that the patient actually died. Okay, so if we have a discharge from agency. So discharge not due to an inpatient facility admission, not due to a death, must be completed within two days of the discharge date, and the visit required, there's a visit required to complete the assessment. So we're going to do RFA 9, discharge from agency. Now, we all know there's exceptions. <laughs> Robin better than all of us. <laughs> if we have an unplanned or unexpected discharge, so this shouldn't occur very often, but it does happen then we can't make a visit. So then we have to do what we call a desk discharge or non-billable discharge. And that, um, so how do you complete an OASIS assessment if you're not assessing the patient, right? Good question. I'm glad you asked. So what you do is you go back and you can go back from the last clinician's note that's qualified to complete the OASIS assessment. So if there's a therapist out there, the therapist can do it. If there's, if it's a nurse, then the nurse can do it. And so in order to make these assessments a little bit more accurate, we have now started giving them to the field clinicians. And um, you're reimbursed at a lower rate because it's quicker. You know, you know the patient better, and you can make these assessments a little bit more accurate than we can. So I have a question about that. Because mm -hmm. I think I have one of those online right now. Okay. But I see her. So I just put the, the assessment from the last time I remember seeing her. Yes. What you do is based off of your last assessment that you were in the home, you can do your OASIS based off of that assessment. Even if it was like a month yes. prior to the Because that's going to give a better picture of what that patient looked like rather than me and I'll never see the patient. Yeah. And so like the vital stuff and stuff. Just you leave those blank. Like, yeah, any any real classes. clinical stuff. Yeah, you leave blank. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're really, at this point, you're only collecting M items. It, the, at that point, it's not an assessment as far as a clinical assessment. It's a, a documentation assessment. You know, you're just gathering, um, what is the right word? Quality, documentation, yeah. billing, things like that. But it does impact our STAR ratings, you know, so it's, it is a, it's an important assessment still, but we can't put any nursing assessment stuff in there because we didn't do it. Right. Yeah. Some examples of unplanned discharges. Uh, the patient transfers to outpatient therapy without first notifying the agency. Patient unexpectedly, unexpectedly moved out of the service area. Unable to make visits because the patient is not homebound and will not keep an appointment. And they unexpectedly unexpectedly refuses services. Um, we want to try to talk our patients into letting us come out because as you see, it's a very important assessment. This is where our star ratings are built on from our star to care to our discharge. And so if they look the same, then we can't show any improvement. So the hope is the discharge assessment, by the time we got there, the patient has improved and those scores are moving the opposite direction, which should be down. <laughs> Um, when a cl clinician completes the dis discharge oasis based on their last visit, the date should be M0090 date assessment completed, the actual date that you completed the assessment, M0903 date of the last most recent home visit, you know, that's self-explanatory, you just look in there and find out when the last home visit is, and then the discharge date, um, it cannot be before the last visit, but whatever that discharge date is, then you would put that. And then make sure you're looking at therapy too, because a lot of times when we, the last visit was a therapy visit. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So this non-delivery <coughs> assessment I used to do, I put the date that she discharged, not necessarily today. Exactly. Yep. Yes. Yep. 
Okay, questions about non billable discharges, transfers, time frames? And of course, when you guys are doing those, you can always call me and I can walk you through it. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, let's talk about diagnoses. Uh, M1017. This question is for diagnosis requiring medical or treatment regime change within the past 14 days. Um, a diagnosis reported in M1011 inpatient diagnoses may also be reported in M1017 if within the last 14 days prior to the start of care or the resumption of care date. So the condition needed to be either new or exacerbated and the condition required changes in the treatment regimen and the patient was discharged from an inpatient facility where the condition was actively treated. Okay, lots of, lots of components to that one. You're gonna report diagnoses that are new, exacerbated, or a change was made due to the lack of improvement or worsening of the condition. So example, CHF exacerbation. But don't report if the diagnosis was a previous condition that only improved during the last 14 days. So example, they have a resolving UTI. We wouldn't need to report that because that's resolved or resolving. Okay, we're gonna get into some specific questions. M1028, active diagnoses, um, comorbidities and coexisting conditions. So you're gonna check all that apply here. This is a new question for OASIS C2. And this question it kind of throws me a little bit too. I'm sure they're going to revise it, but this is the only question in the whole ACES assessment that could accurately be answered by leaving blank. The only one. So if they have PVD or PAD, you're going to check that. If they have diabetes, you're going to check that. So active diagnosis, increased risk for development or worsening of pressure ulcers. So this is the reason why they put this in there, because this indicates that the patient, if they have those diagnoses, <laughs> then they have an increased risk for developing or worsening of pressure ulcers. They have a direct relationship to the, the patient's current functional cognitive mood or behavioral medical treatments. Um, nurse should be monitoring these. And there could be an increased risk of death at the no, that's not true. <laughs> We're going to not talk about that last one. That didn't make any sense. <laughs> Diagnosis must be documented as active by the physician, NP, PA, CNS. They can be directly stated or may be inferred as active by statements related to med management, treatment changes, need for nurse monitoring, med management by the nurse. So if your patient has medications per for PVD, or DM or both, then check those boxes. Even if we don't see that diagnosis list, that's pretty much what it's telling you. If it's inferred, if they talk about it. Um, and then of course the question would be, how are you gonna incorporate this type of information into your plan of care? So that there should be interventions, there should be goals. Okay, so you'll select response one. If the patient has active diagnosis of peripheral vascular disease or peripheral arterial disease. Select response two. If the patient has an active diagnosis of diabetes. If the patient has neither PVD, PAD, or DM, this is where you're gonna just leave it blank. Um, you can put a dash. Now this is something new with OASIS C2 as well. They have the option of putting dashes in questions. So for instance, if you happen to have been in a patient's home and you're, you're filling out an assessment and you get the majority of it done and you have to transfer them to the hospital, but you weren't able to answer all the questions, then that's an instance where you would put a dash in this answer, okay? M1030 therapies at home. So this is only talking about therapies received at home. It doesn't matter who's managing the therapy. So it could be the patient, it could be their caregivers. It doesn't have to be us um, as long as they're getting that type of therapy at home. It excludes therapies administered in outpatient facilities. If patient will receive such therapies as a result of assessment, mark the applicable therapy. And you can mark more than one answer here. So response one. This is referencing IV or infusing ther infusion therapy. So examples of infusion include sub-Q, 
So this is infusion, not injection. Okay, so they do some, I've seen some sub-Q infusion pumps, uh, pain pumps. So that would be considered an infusion. Epidural, intrathecal insulin pump, eclipse bulb infusion device, dialysis, if at home, right, either hemo or peritoneal. Flush of a PD catheter when dialysis is, a, is on hold is considered IV infusion. Um, but however, do not include flushing catheters ut utilized for urinary drainage. Okay, so urinary catheters would not be included. Nor do you include PD catheters used to drain ascites and thin flush. So it's just for the dialysis ones. Okay, again, response one. You're not going to select response one if you're only doing intermittent flushes and or infusion is occurring at home. Or I'm sorry, do re select response one if you're only doing intermittent flushes or the infusion is occurring at home. Medication is both infusing via Q pump and the Q pump is also discontinued on the day of assessment. So if you have to discontinue it and it was there when you got there, you check one. Okay. However, you're not going to select response one if your IV catheter is present but not active. So no flushing or infusion is going on while they're at home. If you have a PRN IV order, but you did not um, administer that PRN order at the start of carrying the rock, you're not going to be able to select response one. Okay. Now, remember we have five days to do this OASIS assessment. So if in that five days that order was implemented, you can go back and select response one. Okay. Response two, peritoneal nutrition. So this is including your TPN or your lipids. Uh, triple lumen with TPN lipids infusing in one port and other lumens flush to maintain paintsy, you're going to mark both response one and response two. So you have an infusion and a flush. You have two lumens. You get to answer one and two. Your single lumen utilized for TPN with pre and post flush as part of the parenteral nutrition, you can only mark um, response two for that one. Response three, enteral nutrition, includes nutrition by nasogastric, gastrostomy, jejunostomy, or any other artificial entry into the alimentary canal. Do not mark response three if the feeding tube is only flushed to maintain patency. Only used to hydrate with water. They're only using it for medications or Pedialyte. So they need to be getting nutrition through that tube in order to mark response three. You're not going to re mark response three if the tube feeding is PRN and the patient did not receive feeding in the prior 24 hours or as a result of your assessment. Response four is none of the above. So that's pretty self-evident. If they don't have anything that we just talked about, that's going to be your answer. Okay. M1041 flu vaccine. Um, so the first question is going to be, does this episode of care, and your episode of care is your start of care, your resumption of care, to your transfer and discharge, okay? Does that include any dates on or between October 1st and March the 31st? So that's an easy one. It's a yes or a no. Yes, if it did. No, if it doesn't. No, you get to skip all the other ones. <laughs> if it's a yes, then you get to go to M1046, and they want to know whether or not the patient got the flu vaccine. And, and you'll see a little star up there. Well, this is one of the questions that impact our star ratings. Okay, so the most favorable answers are one through three. Yeah, the patient did get it from our agency during this episode of care is number one. Number two is yes, the patient got it from our agency during a prior episode of care. Or number three, which is probably most likely if the patient got it. They did get it, but from somebody else, another healthcare provider, their doctor, the pharmacist, Walgreens, somebody else gave it to them. Okay, that's your, your most favorable answers. One, two, three. Yes, they got it. Four is no, the patient declined. Five is no, the patient assessed and determined to have a medical contraindication. If you choose five, please comment on what that contraindication is. Six, no, not indicated. Patient does not meet age conditions guidelines for the flu vaccine. That will not be any of our patients that I can think of offhand. Okay, but again, if you do choose that answer, please elaborate on, on how that is true. Um, seven, no inability to obtain flu vaccine due to declared shortage. 
Now, that doesn't mean your local Walgreens is out. That doesn't even mean your state is out. That means there's a national shortage. So if you mark seven, that means everybody else in the country should be marking seven as well. Okay. Um, eight, no patient did not receive the vaccine due to the reasons other than those listed in responses four through seven. So the expanded instructions with this one include when clinician is unable to determine if the patient received the influenza vaccine, response eight is the correct response. Okay, the pneumococcal vaccine, a uh, simple yes or no question, Has, have they ever received it, yes or no? If you can't uh, determine if the patient received it, response zero, no, is the correct response. Uh, M1056, if the patient has never received it, now they want to know why. Why didn't your patient get it? So you have four options. One is offered and declined. Two is assessed and determined to have medical contraindications. And three, not indicated. The patient does not meet age condition guidelines for pneumonia vaccine. Or four, none of the above. Okay, so this is a new question. Um, in 1060, and this is one of the reasons why we want everybody to have scales with them when they go into the patient's home. We have to weigh and measure the patient. And this item is only collected at the start of care or the resumption of care. And they're doing this to calculate the BMI, basically. Um, so we measure in inches and we weigh in pounds. They, they have a little bit of a, a problem with the way that this question is worded and the intent of the question. So if you'll see on B, um, it says weight in pounds, and then it says base weight on most recent measure in last 30 days. And I've written over that disregard because that's not accurate. Although that is in your OASIS and it says to do that, when they came out with the intention of the questions and your guidelines, they tell you do not do that. Only use the most current accurate weight. Now, what do you do if a patient can't weigh? Put dashes, right? So if you have a patient that you can't, it's not safe to weigh them, put dashes. This is one of those um, questions that we can't add a dash and that would be appropriate. You're going to round up to the nearest inch or pound. Okay. And how do you measure a patient that is maybe a, an amputee, a bilateral amputee? Well, you, you don't take his height based on before he was a bilateral amputee. Okay. So one of the ways that you could do that is have them lie in bed and measure them that way. Okay, so if it's not safe to weigh them, you know, we talked about that, but there's a lot of reasons why you may not weigh a patient. You know, maybe they're a, a mobility risk, a fall risk. They're having a lot of pain. They just, you know, they, they're sick. They can't get up and stand on the scale. It's okay. Go ahead and put dashes, but please comment. Write that in your comment section why that patient wasn't able to be weighed because the more you comment and the more you explain your rationale behind the answers that you give, the, the, the less often your oasis will be sent back for questions. Um, Robin? I don't think there's a way to comment on that one. You can put in your clinical summary. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because that was one thing I had trouble with sometimes when we first started out. Yeah. Yeah. If you can't comment right into the question, then go ahead and just put it in your clinical summary. Okay. Let's talk about pain. M1242. Um, so the question wants to know, does the patient have pain, the frequency of pain interfering with patient's activity or movement? So that's your first point on pain. Do they have a frequency of pain that interferes with their activity or movement? So zero is nope. They have no pain ever, never, ever, no matter what they do, zero. One, the patient has pain, but it doesn't interfere with anything that they, they can do. They can carry on with their activity and movement safely and just as they did before with no problems. Two is, yeah, they do have pain, but it's less often than daily and it is interfering with things, but it's not every day. Three, yeah, they have pain that interferes with their activity or their movement and hurts them. It's daily, you know, but not all the time, not constant, just in the morning when they get up or at night when they start to go to bed. Four, they have pain all the time. They have pain all day long, all night long when they sleep. They have pain all the time. That's your four. So remember, we're not just measuring 
pain on a scale of you know one to ten. We want to know how often you have pain. And this is part of the comprehensive assessment. You know, in order to do a good pain management, we need to know what type of pain they're having. You know, describe that pain. Where is the pain? Is it a stabbing shooting pain? Is it a dull aching pain? Could they be having neuropathic pain? Is it bone pain? Because depending on the type of pain will help you guide the physician in determining what the best um, pain re regimen is for that patient. So if they're not getting any relief and you see that they're on all of these narcotics, but they have sharp shooting pain and you know it's a nerve pain, then the narcotics probably aren't going to help. They need to be on, you know, something specific for nerve pain. The same is true with bone pain, your dull, aching, deep pain. Your narcotics aren't going to help. Your opioids won't touch it. You need an NSAID or, you know, an anti-inflammatory, um, something along those na that nature that will decrease the inflammation around the bone so that the pain can be relieved. So understanding what kind of pain they're having will help us treat the pain and hopefully be able to lower their pain score. Now, this is an interesting one, and their time period here is unique to pain. It's the day of assessment. Remember, that's the time that you're in there up to the preceding 24 hours and the recent pertinent past, the recent pertinent past. So we want to assess the patient when they're moving. Don't overlook activities such as sleeping, eating, hobbies, things of that nature. So if they are restricting their um, activity to avoid pain, then they do have pain, okay? So find out how often the patient would usually perform that activity. Uh, pain does not have to totally prevent an activity, so it may cause it to take longer, um, being performed less often than, than desired, or if they need some help, then they do have pain. If the activity stopped some time ago in order to avoid the pain, it may not be relevant. So recent pertinent past, let's talk about when that's relevant and when that's not relevant. So you walk into Mrs. Jones's house and she has a beautiful piano and she has all of this, you know, crocheted um, Kleenex box crochets and little doilies and all of this stuff all over her house. And you start talking to her and say, oh, that's so lovely. You know, did you do that? Yeah, yeah, I did that. And do you play the piano? Well, honey, I used to, but I haven't been able to play the piano or crochet in some time. Really, how, how long has that been? Well, a couple of months. My arthritis really got bad, and I'm not able to do that now. So that's recent, and it's pertinent because it's changing the things that she enjoys doing. Okay? Same, uh, different little scenario. Maybe her husband, maybe Mr. Jones, is there, and we're talking to him about his knee pain, and we ask him, well, has that changed anything that you enjoy doing? Oh, yeah, I haven't been able to, to snow ski since, since, since I had my knee injury. Well, really, how long ago was that? Oh, about 15 years ago. And he's 78. You know, well, Mr. Jones will never snow ski again, unfortunately, but that's not pertinent. So we wouldn't include that as avoiding or stopping activities. However, Mrs. Jones's decrease in her activities would be pertinent and we would score that accordingly. OK, so impact of pain medications. Is it possible for a patient to take pain medications and M1242B, no. And the reason this came up, because we used to have the philosophy of if the patient's on pain medication, they have to have pain. Otherwise, why would they take the pain medication, right? Well, the, the truth is, is that the patient could have no pain if they're constantly on their pain medicine and it works, right? That's the goal. And so that's how we can help improve our patient's pain score potentially is if we go in and we find the patient's having pain frequently, but they're only on PRN medication. Well, maybe they need to be on a scheduled pain medication. So when we get them off the PRN pain medication and we get them on a scheduled medication, and now they don't have any pain, and then we've improved our pain score. So yes, that can be true. They can be on pain medications and still, still score a zero. So let's do this case scenario. And everybody on the line, it would be great if y'all chimed in, so not to put Holly and Robin on the on the spotlight. <laughs> okay, so Mrs. Davis states her pain is no bother as long as she walks slowly and doesn't sit in the same position for too long. Once she takes her Ambien at night, she can sleep comfortably without taking any special precautions. So M1242, frequency of pain interfering with the patient's activity or movement. How would you answer this? Zero, patient has no pain. 
One, patient has pain that does not interfere with activity or movement. Two, less often than daily. Three, daily but not constantly. Or four, all of the time. One. Patient has pain that does not fear with activity or movement. One, does everybody agree with that? Yeah. Okay. All right. So what do we say? We have some no's in the room. Holly and Robin say no. Okay. She, she sits too long and then it does affect her activity. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Daily but not constantly. So we got a three, which is the correct answer. Okay. So let's talk about why three is right and one is not right. And, and don't... I'm glad that you spoke up and please everybody speak up. Don't worry about being right. I would rather talk about different scenarios. So one, so let's go back to the, the scenario. Mrs. Davis states her pain is no bother as long as she walks slowly. Okay. So remember what we talked about. Is it interfering with them? How do we know if it's interfering? So if they're doing things a little bit slower, less often, right? So right there, it doesn't hurt her if she walks slowly. So that tells you that she's modified her activity due to pain. And so she has to walk every day. Okay. And if she doesn't sit in the same position for too long. So anytime she's sitting or walking, there's a potential for her to have pain unless she modifies her activity. So um, she is having pain daily, but it's not all the time. So it's only when she's walking or sitting. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Yes, yeah. it does. Great. Okay. Shortness of breath. 1400. When is the patient uh, dyspneic or noticeably short of breath? So we have four options here as well. Zero. Patient is not short of breath. <laughs> One. When walking more than 20 feet or climbing stairs. Two. With moderate exertion. Example, while they're dressing, using commode or bedpan, walking distances less than 20 feet. With minimal or three minimal exertion. Example: While you're eating, talking, performing other ADLs, or with agitation. Don't forget the with agitation. Okay. Uh, four at rest. So this is during day or night at rest. So level of exertion activity causing dyspnea or short of breath. Report what is true on the day of assessment. So observe if the patient is noticeably short of breath. So interview regarding prior 24 hours. Don't forget your prior 24 hours. Refer to examples included in response to determine the amount of effort it took to cause dyspnea. So for example, for examples are illustrated and not absolute, so you need to use your own judgment. So for example, if the patient becomes short of breath when they're raising their arms to dress, that would be minimal exertion. That's not while dressing because it was just because they raised, rose their, raised their arms because <laughs> they raised their arms caused them to get short of breath. It wasn't the effort of dressing. It was the effort of raising their arms. Okay. Impact of oxygen. This is always interesting. So um, if the patient uses oxygen continuously and continuously means they never, ever, never, ever take it off then you're going to assess them with their oxygen. If the patient uses oxygen intermittently, that means maybe uh, they take their oxygen off while they eat or they take their oxygen off while um, they go outside and smoke a cigarette or they take, you know it happens, <laughs> or they take their oxygen off while they're getting in the bathtub. Even if only for a little bit of time, you are going to assess them without their oxygen. Okay? For example, if ordered continuously, but patient uses PRN, assess without oxygen. I think we went over that. So if oxygen only used it at night due to positional dyspnea, report level of exertion that causes dyspnea without oxygen. So we want to find out where they're at before they put that on. All right. Another case scenario. And don't be shy. At discharge, Mr. Hardy reports he never feels short of breath because he uses his oxygen most of the time. Although it does make his ears sore, so he takes it off while sitting in his chair. You notice that he became slightly short of breath while talking. So how are we going to answer M1400? Zero, patient is not short of breath. One, when climbing, when walking more than 20 feet or climbing stairs. 
Two, with moderate exertion while dressing, using commode or bedpan, walking distances less than 20 feet. Three, with minimal exertion while eating, talking, performing ADLs, or with agitation, or four, at rest during day or night. Three. Three. Does everybody agree with three? Yes. Yes. That is correct because three is correct because he got short of breath when he took his oxygen off for a little bit and started talking, right? So we had to assess him without his oxygen because he didn't use it all the time. It doesn't really matter what they tell you, right? We have to really look at what they're doing. Okay, so let's talk about pressure ulcers. And this was new guidance last January. April 2016, the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel announced updated terminology for the staging system. <laughs> pressure ulcers changed to pressure injury. Okay, so now if you were in the hospital or somewhere else, you might hear them use the word pressure injury because that is our correct terminology. However, uh, CMS is always behind the WOCN by a couple of years or three. And so we won't see that change in our assessment probably to the next update. They also removed suspected from the SDTI suspected deep tissue injury. Now it's just deep tissue injury. So just some terminology changes there. Um, okay, so we're going to default to our CMS OASIS instructions, not the WOCN, because we have to follow CMS. At some point, they'll catch up. So the pressure ulcer definition is, is defined as a localized injury to skin and or underlying tissue, it's usually over bony prominence, as a result of pressure. So our pressure ulcer assessment was this patient at risk for developing pressure ulcers. So we have 0, 1, 2 to answer. No assessment conducted. Please never ever put that unless something happened and the patient was whisked off to a hospital or something. So your answer should always be either 1 or 2, and it should really be a 2, okay, in this box. So 1, yes. We based an evaluation of clinical factors, for example, mobility, incontinence, nutrition, without the use of a standardized tool. So one, you just used your clinical skills, but you didn't use a standardized tool, which is your brain scale or your Norton scale. Our brain scale is built into our OASIS assessment, and we expect that to be used. So your answer here, unless something unique happens, should always be a two. We assess them, and we use the standardized tool. Okay, so your next question was, well, were they at risk or not? How did your assessment go? And so you're going to answer zero, no, or one, yes. Now, this, this question I really like because not all of them allow the clinician to have a voice, whereas this question does allow our clinicians to have a voice, meaning that if your brain score said, no, they're not at risk, and your clinical skills tell you, yeah, they are really think that they're at risk, then you can say yes, that they are at risk. Okay, so if you perform both an evaluation of clinical factors and use of a standardized tool, and 1300 is two, yes, using a standardized tool, or one, yes, if either indicated risk. So skip M1300, no assessment conducted. Okay, so apply what you learn. At the start of care, the RN assessed Mr. Richter using both the Braden and an evaluation of clinical factors. The brain revealed the patient was not at risk for developing pressure ulcers, but the RN's evaluation based on clinical factors revealed the patient was at risk. How are you going to answer M1300 and M1302? So did you do an assessment and did you use a standardized tool? What are we going to answer on that one? Two, yeah, because we, we use the Braden tool, right? Um, was the patient at risk? The Braden tool said he was not at risk. You as an RN felt that he was at risk. How are we going to answer 1302? Yes. Is everybody okay with that? <clears throat> yes? Yes. 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 Perfect. That's correct. Okay. 
Let's talk a little bit about staging pressure ulcers. The assessing clinician may report a pressure ulcer and its stage on oasis based on visual observation without physician confirmation. So what does this mean? It means that we're better at staging than the doctors are. <laughs> but what it truly means is that the doctor has to diagnose the type of wound, but they, they trust our clinical judgment in staging the pressure ulcer. So, you know, if you get information from um, the hospital, let's say, and they say the patient has stage two pressure ulcer on their ankle, and then when you go out to assess, it's down to the fatty tissue, and you're like, no, that's a stage three, then you put stage three, because it could have gotten worse, you know, or they could have misstaged it, but most likely it got worse. Um, here's the key. Does everybody know this? Well, let me just ask this question. Do we reverse stage? Like when it's getting better, did that pressure ulcer come from a three, turn into like a one now? I'm we, did, but we, don't. we do not. That's right. We never, ever, ever, never reverse stage. Our pressure ulcers are never get better with staging. And the reason behind that is because they've determined that any stage three or four pressure ulcers really never quite heal all the way. Their tensillary strength is never 100%. It's like 80%. And so they have a potential of always breaking down there. Now, before January of last year, um, we even if they were resurfaced and closed to stage three or four, we counted those as pressure ulcers. So that kind of sticks in your mind about not downstaging or reverse staging. Now we don't do that. We say that they're healed. However, if you know that that patient had a stage three or a stage four, then you want to document that and we code it still. So that's what's really unique about this. We put it in the codes. We document it, but on your pressure ulcer assessment, it's zeros. They don't have it. Talk to me, Holly. What? <laughs> I know. So it's stage four, but it's healed. Mm -hmm. and there's none there, but mm -hmm. it's put that it's stage four. Yes. It, 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 yes, because, because there is that potential. And if a stage three or a stage four were to break down, then we want to know, first of all, that it was a stage four. And at that point, we're not going to stage it at a one or a two. That will always be a stage four. So what about that? Because I just did a research on somebody who had a stage four. I, I wouldn't say it's a stage four now. I would say it's a stage three now. Mm -hmm. So why don't we show that improvement? You're going to, sh yes, you're going to show the improvement <laughs> in your assessment of the wound. Okay. But, but pressure ulcer staging, it never, it never reverses. That's always, you know, just an unknown thing because a stage four minute went down to their bone, right? It's, it's deep, deep, deep. That will never really ever heal. And so that tells the doctor and the clinicians, be careful with this. Watch this, because although it's resurfacing and it's doing really well, it could easily go back down to the bone, you know. And so that's just what the WOCN determined is the best way to manage these patients and to assess these patients is that we never reverse um, staging. So it's a healing state. I would say it's a healing stage four. Um, and then I would describe it. You know, cannot see, you know, underlying structures and structures anymore. Can, has a nice wound bed, see fatty tissue, whatever it looks like, then you describe it. And so um, we tell that way. Yep. So does, does that, do y'all have questions? I do. Okay. Um, I have a question. Oh, so is that the same for stage one and stage two where stage one is more, um, obviously it's not all the way down to the bone. I mean, it's very superficial. It's not the same for stage one and stage two. We don't reverse staging, but they do heal and we don't track those. For, so if your stage two were to <laughs> break down again and it was uh -huh. stage one, you would say it's a stage one. You wouldn't keep keep track of that stage two. So it's a little bit different there. We don't reverse okay. staging. That's, just, that's true. Our stage two will never be a stage one. But once the stage two heals and is gone and later, mm -hmm. if it were to break down, it could be a stage one then. Okay. I oh, got it. Okay. Okay. So any other questions? Yeah. It gets confusing on these pressure ulcers. It really does. Um, all right. So if you see any visible bone, tendon, muscle, joint capsule, any, it doesn't have to be a lot, any, then you know you have a stage four. 
okay? And um, it doesn't matter if there's slough, if there's escar, it doesn't matter what's going on. You have a stage four and you call it that and it will ever be a stage four. A pressure ulcer covered with slough or escar is not stageable, but is considered visible, observable to determine healing status. So if it's covered, I think it's 25% of the wound bed. I'll have to look. We'll get into that. I think if it's 25% of the wound bed that's covered in slough or escar, then it's not considered stageable. But let me tell you this. If your wound has slough or escar, it is not a stage two. Stage two wounds never get slough or escar. So once you debreed that, you know it's le at least a stage three. Okay. So that makes it easy. So if, it, if you see bone or tendon, then it's a stage four. So it kind of makes it easy to stage those. Uh, a previously stageable pressure, pressure ulcer can become unstageable when it becomes covered with slough or escar, or some degree of narcotic tissue develops, obscures the visualization of a stage four structure, then it's unstageable. And I know you're all going, but wait, 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 a stage four is always a stage four. That's true. But for assessment purposes, we're going to document unstageable. And then the minute you get enough of that slough or escar off of there. And even if you were to see only fatty tissue, it's still a stage four because we knew at one time it was, okay? Um, if it becomes covered with a dressing or a device, maybe your wound back, you go out there, your pressure ulcer has a wound back, you can't take it off today, that's unstageable. We don't know what stage it is, okay? If you have a pressure ulcer that is debrided, it is still a pressure ulcer. There was a lot going on about, is it now a surgical wound? Because we surgically debrided it. The answer is no, it's a pressure ulcer. Okay. Questions? <clears throat> Patient assessment should be completed as close to the actual time of the start of care or the resumption of care as possible. Do not change assessment for an ulcer that increases in numerical stage within the assessment time period. So what the heck does that mean, right? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it later as well. But remember we talked about you have the five days and you have your IV patient and, and we didn't start the PRN IV on day one, but we did on day two. And we can go back and we can change that answer to yes, they had an infusion. Okay, we can't do that with pressure ulcers. Although we have five days to complete the OASIS assessment and Every M item except for pressure ulcer staging can be changed within five days if we if we know, find out something different. The, the exception to that rule is your pressure ulcer. So if you go out on day one and you um, you assess your pressure ulcer and it's a stage two and you go back, back out on day two to start that IV patient and your pressure ulcer is a stage three, you can also change the pressure ulcer. It stays a stage two. That's what that's saying. Okay, so once you stage it, whenever it was in that five day window, it just stays that way. Healed versus unhealed, we're talking about closed versus open. Okay, a stage one pressure ulcer is technically um, closed, but that's not going to be, that's never going to be considered healed. If you have a stage one, it's always unhealed. Okay, the same is true with the DTIS. If it's, it's closed and intact, but they're never going to be considered healed. And the reason that they're talking about this is because, like we said, about the threes and the fours, we used to call them unhealed. Now, anything that's resurfaced, your stage twos, your stage threes, your stage fours, they are now healed. Okay? Healed. And that, this is just for, like, old school thinking people. <laughs> um, once a pressure ulcer, always a pressure ulcer. That used to be the saying. That's not true anymore for assessment purposes. It's true for coding and tracking, but not assessment purposes. So now they've told us all pressure ulcers can heal. Once a stage one pressure ulcer is no longer red, non-blanchable, it's considered healed and no longer reported as a pressure ulcer. Once a stage two, three, or four pressure ulcer is completely covered with new epithelial tissue, it is considered healed and no longer reported as a pressure ulcer. Previously closed stage three or four pressure ulcers, currently open again, is reported at its worst stage. That's when we track them because we need to know what the worst stage is. Okay, so when you have a pressure ulcer that had a flap done to it or a graft done to it, no longer are these two considered pressure ulcers. These are now surgical wounds. Okay, if it's sharp debridement, still a pressure ulcer, flap or graft, surgical wounds. 
So if that happens, and they like you have to do a rock clear out of the hospital, mm -hmm. so then you <clears throat> you would say their pressure ulcer is healed. They would. They don't have a pressure ulcer. Well, how do you? You would get rid of it. And just take it off. They don't have one. It's zero. It's zero. And now they're going to have a surgical wound. And you're going to explain that in your clinical summary. That's why clinical summaries are so important, you know. And, um, yeah, so that, that explanation will be within your clinical summary. Okay. But within the data collection, and remember, this is data collection. They don't have a pressure ulcer. Surgical one. It, it magically disappeared. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they'll be able to track it. You know, they'll see, oh, now they have a surgical wound, you know. But, yeah. Okay, so M1306, unhealed pressure ulcer, stage 2 or higher, or unstageable. Okay, so M1306, does the patient have at least one unhealed pressure ulcer at stage 2 or higher, designated as unstageable, or designated as unstageable? So this excludes stage 1. So basically, this question just wants to know, do they have a pressure ulcer, stage 2 or higher? Yes or no, it's a very simple, straightforward question. Okay, so um, open stage two, three, or, so you're going to say yes if they do. I mean, if they have an unstageable pressure ulcer, it's still going to be yes. So you have a patient that comes to you, and in their clinical summary, we know that they have a pressure ulcer under that wound bag, but you can't take it off. You can't see it. You know that it was staged previously as a stage three. Then we're going to mark, yeah, they have a pressure ulcer. That one's unstageable. I can't see it, but I know it's there because that's why they have the wound back. So unstageable pressure ulcers are defined as known but unobservable due to dressing device that cannot be removed, full thickness tissue loss, and no stage four structure visible and some degree of eschar slop that may be obscuring visual visualization of stage four structures, and this is your clinical judgment, or if they have a suspected deep tissue injury, we're going to say yes, they have um, a pressure ulcer, stage two or greater on M1306. De a suspected deep tissue injury. This is a big deal at, at this question on understanding how to assess whether or not they have a suspected deep tissue injury and not a stage one pressure ulcer. So on a stage one, you, you know, it's kind of non-blanchable and red, you know, but you want to kind of poke around on it because if around the edges of it, if it's kind of boggy and squishy, that's your deep tissue injury. It's suspected. We don't know for sure, but based on your assessment, there's something else going on under there. Then you're going to mark that as a one here. Okay, that's a suspected deep tissue injury. And then that way, if it were to open up, it, it doesn't look like we didn't understand it and we didn't provide appropriate interventions to prevent it. Okay, so let's do this case scenario. Apply what you just learned. Mrs. Taylor at the resumption of care had three pressure ulcers. A stage one on the left elbow, a former stage two on the occipital area that has been covered in epithelial tissue for two weeks, and a stage four over the left trochanter with exposed tendon and wound bed 50% covered in slough. So how are we going to answer 1306? Does the patient have at least one unhealed pressure ulcer, a stage two or higher, or unstageable? Okay, and tell me which one that is. We have a yes. The stage four or one. Okay, so Holly said yes, and the stage four trochanter one. Does everybody agree with that? Is everybody there? <laughs> um, I guess I'm confused because they have the stage two. Is that one considered unstageable because it has the epithelial tissue? Okay, so the stage two in the occipital area that has been covered with epithelial tissue. So if you have a stage two that's covered with epithelial tissue, that means it's healed, right? So it has okay. nice, good, clean tissue over it. And once the stage two is healed, or once any of them are, are resurfaced, then we don't count them anymore. So the stage okay. one didn't qualify, and the stage two is healed. So the only one we really have is a stage four, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good question. And and I'll tell you, I think these scenarios are more confusing than real life <laughs> because when you're looking at the patient, you would say, oh, that's healed, you know, but yeah. Okay. 
that threw me off. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they get a little tricky. Good question. Okay, so let's talk about M1307. Oldest stage two pressure ulcer present at discharge. Now, this question only comes up at discharge. They want to know what is the oldest stage two pressure ulcer that's present currently. And they want to know, was it there at the most recent start of care or resumption in care? So, first of all, does the patient have a stage two pressure ulcer? If no, then you're going to put NA. They don't have a pressure ulcer, stage two. If, you're going to, if you say yes, the next thing you need to find out is, was it there at the last sock or rock? And if, if that's true, then you're going to put a one. And if that is not true, this is where they start judging our quality. That means that it happened on our watch, right? So you're going to put a two, and then you're going to have to put the date that that occurred. Make sense? If they have a pressure ulcer stage two or at discharge. It's a one. It was there at the last start of care, resumption of care, or two. It was not there. It developed and would put the date. They don't have one. It's easy in A. So it's non-epithelialized stage two pressure ulcers. Um, we went through that. Okay, here's our case scenario. Mr. Rodriguez is being discharged to the home hospice benefit. He has three stage four pressure ulcers and two stage two ulcers. One stage two was present at the October 10th start of care, but is now under a newly applied cast. The other was first identified November the 2nd, 20, 2016, and is not fully epithelialized. So we only want to know about stage two pressure ulcers. So the first question you're going to ask yourself is, does he have a stage two pressure ulcer? I have a yes. Okay. Was it present at the most recent start of care or resumption of care? Yes. I have a yes. Okay, so, and I have yes. a no. And I have a yes. And I have a no. <laughs> okay, I think we have some confusion. Let's go back to our scenario. Um, has three stage four pressure ulcers and two stage two. So we know he has it, so that's that's correct. One stage two was present at the October 10th start of care. So that's when our start of care was October 10th, but is now under a newly applied cast. Now, that one is under a cast, so we don't know what stage it is. So that one is considered unstageable. So we're only looking at pressure ulcers that are stageable. So we have to mark that one off. So that one doesn't count. The other was first identified November the 2nd and is not fully epithelialized, which means he still has an active stage two that we can see that we can stage. Because remember, if it's, if it's under an applied cast or device or full of SCAR, you can't stage it. So we can't say it's a two. So the correct answer would be two, and the date you're, you're going to put is November the 2nd, 2016. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay. Yes, it does. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, this is fun. M1311. We want to know the current number of unhealed pressure ulcers at each stage. Okay, so you have a two-part question. This only applies to stage two and greater and unstageable. Row one identifies pressure ulcers that are currently present. Okay, currently present. Row two identifies whether the current pressure ulcer was the same stage at the most recent start of care or resumption of care. Okay. So let me go back and let's just look at some of these. So stage two, A1, stage two. They want to know if your patient has a stage two pressure ulcer, and if so, how many? So if they had three, you're going to put three in A1, in box A1. Then they're, they're going to want to know, were all of these pressure ulcers present at the start of care or the resumption of care, or how many of these? And if all of them were, you're going to put a state at three. But maybe some of them were. Maybe only one of them was. Then you would put a two there. Okay? So if you had a pressure ulcer that was a stage two, 
or no, let's go. If you had a pressure ulcer that was a stage three, I'm trying to give you scenarios. We'll get to scenarios. I won't do that. It's, it's too confusing. So then they want to talk about unstageable pressure ulcers. So D1 would be unstageable due to a non-removable dressing, known but not stageable due to a non-removable dressing. So does the patient have a pressure ulcer? You know it's a pressure ulcer because you either saw it or it's in the H&P, but you, they have a non-removable dressing. So you enter the number of those and whether or not it was present at the start of care. And on, on this question, you have to put a number in each box. Don't leave it blank. It either has to be a zero or, or greater, okay? E1, unstageable. So the, the, the pressure ulcer is covered with slough and or ASCAR to the degree that you cannot stage it. We know it's a pressure ulcer, but we can't stage it. That's E1, it has slough or ASCAR. F1 is your deep tissue injury. Remember, we assessed that earlier. We're not going to mark that as a, as a state two pressure ulcer. So where do we capture it? Right here on M1311. We suspect that they have a deep tissue injury. Okay. So the intent identifies the number of stage two or higher pressure ulcers at each stage present at the time of assessment. Stage one pressure ulcers and ulcers that have, have healed are not reported. So you're not going to report your closed threes or your fours. Okay, so we're going to only include any open stage two or greater and anything that's unstageable. Okay, so we talked about this earlier. It comes up again in this slide. When a pressure ulcer stage worsens before the assessment is completed, that five-day window or 48-hour window, depending on which assessment, report, report the ulcer at its initial stage. So for each pressure ulcer, Determine whether the pressure ulcer was present at the time of the most recent sock rock and did not form during this home health quality episode. Um, Roll two would only be completed at the follow-up and discharge assessment. When any bone, tendon, muscle, or joint are visible, report as a stage four, regardless of the presence or absence of slough or escar. So we talked about this before, too. If they have a graph or um, a flap, they are no longer a pressure ulcer, and we're not going to re report it here, okay? Okay. We went through our unstageables. Let's see. So if the pressure ulcer was unstageable at the most recent start of care resumption of care, but becomes numerically stageable later when completing the discharge assessment, its stage should be considered the stage at which it first became stageable. So if it subsequent increases in numerical stage, do not report the higher stage. Also as being um, present at the start of care resumption care when, when completing the discharge assessment. Okay, so it was unstageable, then it becomes stageable. We're not going to increase it, okay? So the patient did not have a pressure ulcer on admission, but developed a stage three pressure ulcer during the first episode, which, which is present at the time of research. So the patient has a stage three. They did not have a pressure ulcer on admission. So how are we going to answer M1311? So does the patient have uh, any stage two pressure ulcers? No. So we're going to put zero. In A1, B1, does the patient have a stage three pressure ulcer? Yes, they have one. So we're going to put one in the first box. And then we have to answer B2. Was that there on, at the last start of care resumption of care? No. So we have to put zero. And then the rest will be zeros. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Good. So that's what it'll look like when you fill it out. Zero blank, one, zero, zero. So if you put a number, you have to put a zero on the bottom box. Okay. So the patient has a healed stage four pressure ulcer at the start of care. He has a cast on his arm and states he believes he has a pressure ulcer under the cast as it feels like it did that time when he had a bad wound. He has a stage one, one pressure ulcer on his coccyx. Okay. So how are we going to answer this? Uh, we're looking for stage two or greater, right? So stage two, 
Does he have any stage two pressure ulcers? I have no, so we're going to put a zero in box A1. B1, does he have any stage three pressure ulcers? Is that a zero? Okay. Does he have any stage four pressure ulcers? He had a healed stage four pressure ulcer, but we don't count that right. So that's going to be a zero. And that's correct. Then this, this would go on to... This should have gone into the unstageable one, so we would have counted that as one unstageable one. But I think the intent of this scenario was to show that we don't capture healed stage fours. Okay, does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Yes. Well, actually, you know, I take that back because he thinks he has a pressure ulcer, and we didn't know it, we didn't see it, so we wouldn't count that too. Okay, sorry, my bad. All right, during the start of care assessment, the nurse documented that the patient had a stage two pressure ulcer to her right elbow. The nurse was unable to complete the assessment and went back on day four, at which time the stage two pressure ulcer progressed to a stage three. So how are we gonna answer this at M1311? Does the patient have any stage two pressure ulcers? Anybody? Yes. Yes. Okay. How many? One. Just one. That's right. Does the patient have any stage three pressure ulcers? Yes. Yes. The patient does have a stage three pressure ulcer. However, can we document that right now? Yes. Okay. Um, well, let's go back to the five-day window on, on a pressure ulcer staging. Remember, we talked about that when you go out, we have whenever you stage your pressure ulcer first, that can't be changed. So al although we do have five days to change all the other questions on the OASIS, we don't have five days to change the pressure ulcer staging. So the scenario reads, during the start of care assessment, the nurse documented that the patient had a stage two pressure ulcer on her right elbow. The nurse was unable to complete the assessment and went back on day four, at which time the stage two pressure ulcer progressed to a stage three. However, mm -hmm. since the nurse did document a stage two, then it can, we can't change it on the start of care assessment. It will be captured on a later assessment. Okay. Okay. So we have one stage two and the rest are zeros. Okay. So during your start of care assessment, the nurse documented that the patient had a stage two pressure ulcer to the right elbow. Same scenario. The nurse was unable to complete the assessment and went back out on day four, at which time the stage two progressed to a stage three. Now, I think this should be the research slide unless I went wrong. Yeah. So at the research, okay, there it is. At the follow-up assessment or your research assessment, how are we going to answer these? So at the research, this is currently what you're looking at. Your patient, it's the same scenario, right? So currently, does your patient have a stage two pressure ulcer? No, right? Because the stage two progressed to a stage three. Does the patient have a stage three pressure ulcer? Yes. This is our research. That's the, the two that went through it from a two to a three in a matter of days. So we're going to mark yes. Was it there at start of care? Unfortunately, we have to say no, it wasn't. Because at start of care, when we first staged that ulcer, it was a two. It's a little convoluted, I think, sometimes. Does that make sense, though? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Patient had a stage four pressure ulcer on the scalp at the start of care and an unhealed stage two on the elbow. A skin graft was performed to the stage four during an outpatient procedure. The patient is now being recertified. The stage two deteriorated to a stage three. So how are we going to answer this one? Does the patient have a stage two? And this is our follow-up assessment.
We had a four that had a graft, right? We had a two at the start of care that deteriorated to a three. Now we're doing our minus five, our, our research. Currently at your research visit, does your patient have a stage two? No, I hear a no. We all agree? Yeah. Yes. yes. Does your patient have a stage three? Yes, I hear a yes, and we have one stage three. Was that there during your most recent start of care? No, so we're going to put a zero. Does your patient have a stage four? No. No, zero, because that is a graph now, right? So that's the way it's going to look, zero, one, zero, zero. We have one stage three currently that was not there at the start of care, and it shows everybody that our stage two deteriorated to a stage three and that now the stage four is healed which looks great you know because now it's a graph okay patient had an unstageable pressure ulcer at the start of care during the episode the pressure ulcer was deep reeded and was a stage three by the time the patient was to be recertified the pressure ulcer progressed to a stage four this is our follow-up oasis. Do we have a stage two? No. No, zero, we're good with that. Okay, do we have a stage three? This is your follow-up assessment. What does a patient look like today, right now? No. No, stage three, correct. Do we have a stage four? Yes, we have one stage four, and then the million dollar question was it there at the start of care? No, because no, it was what? It was, but it wasn't a four. Was the stage four there at the start of care? But was it there? <laughs> no, and yeah, they're doing this to see how well do we manage pressure ulcers in home health. Are they getting worse? Or are they getting better? That's the whole intent of M1311. Remember at the very, very beginning, I said, if you understand this is a quality measure, this is a data collection tool, then it helps sometimes get over the clinical hurdles. <laughs> because in the same sense, when that stage four disappeared, now we all know that it was there. Okay. But the according to data collection, it was gone. That's only for us because now we, we it's won. Mm -hmm. And so it's like she says, all just data. Yeah. And and that's especially when we go further. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. This question M13. Or, well, let me ask everybody on the phone. Were y'all good with that one? Yeah. I yeah. am. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Yes. And again, I think the scenarios sometimes are harder to answer than it would be if you had a patient in front of you, you know, because they get convoluted a little bit in my opinion. Okay, so this M1313 worsening and pressure ulcer status since the start of care resumption of care, this question only comes up at discharge. Okay, and so what they want to know is when you're discharging your patient, do they have a new or worse worsened pressure ulcer? That means, you know, did they increase the stage, right? So indicate the number of current pressure ulcers that were not present or were a lesser stage at the most recent start of care or resumption of care. If no current pressure ulcers are given, stage enter zero. Don't leave it blank. Remember, the only question we can leave blank is M1028. Everything else, you have to have something in there. So if they don't have any pressure ulcers, that's a pretty easy one, just zero still all, okay? Now, so if your patient does have a pressure ulcer, the question that you have to ask is, is it new? If the answer is, nope, it's not new, then your next question is, is it worse? Has it increased in numerical stage value? And if the answer to that is no, then all zeros again. They only want to know what is new or worse since your last sock rock. Good? Okay. Okay, so this is a little algorithm. I've skipped over to slide 91. And this is an algorithm that kind of helps you answer M1313. 
And um, some people love it. Some people hate it. It just depends on how you learn. Um, if you want a copy of it, let me know and I can get you a better copy than probably what's in the slide. But it just kind of tells you like if the patient currently has a stage two pressure ulcer at discharge, you're going to look back at your most recent start of care or resumption of care. Okay. And if it was not present, then you're going to say yes. If it was a stage one, you're going to say yes. If it's covered with non-removable dressing device, then document it as a stage one at any home visit or follow-up assessment, then you're going to say yes. So what that's telling you is that if you can't stage it at your start of care resumption of care because it's unstageable, later you stage it. That, that point at later you stage it is considered your start of care stage. Okay, so the first time it's staged, you can replace um, the start of care stage with the first time it's staged if it's an unstageable pressure, ul pressure ulcer, and that's the stage you go by. Okay, I'm not going to read all of this to you guys. Um, you can you can read it. And like I said, look through the slide. If it's something that you want in a you know single page handout, let me know, and I'm happy to get that for you. Yeah, I want to clear something that we're gonna please. Um, it talks about look back to the most recent soft rock, mm -hmm. not most recent oasis as in research or anything like that. Exactly. Yeah, very good point. Yes. We're looking at uh, start of care or resumption of cares only, not minus fives or anything like that. Okay. Here's a scenario for you. At the discharge, Miss Phillips has a stage three pressure ulcer on her left elbow that had been assessed as a stage two at the start of care. So first question we're going to ask is, does your patient have a current open pressure ulcer? What is our answer? Yes. yes. Second question, um, what stage is it? It's a stage three. Is that worse than it was before? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it's, they have current pressure ulcer. It is worse. And so then what we need to do, it's a stage three. So do they have a stage two? Nope. We're going to put a zero. Do they have a stage three? Yes. We're going to put a one. And then zeros in the remaining one. They know by our previous OASIS assessments that that was a stage two. So they're going to know that it declined. Okay. So if the pressure ulcer was unstageable at the start of care or resumption of care, but becomes numerically stageable later, its stage should be considered the stage at which it first becomes numerically stageable. So that would be considered your start of care. Okay. If the pressure ulcer was unstageable for any reason at the most recent sock rock, do not consider it new or worse. If at the same point between the sock rock and discharge, it became and remained at the same stage at discharge. Okay, so we're looking for new or worse pressure ulcers. At the start of care, Mr. Rudy had a pressure ulcer completely covered with escar. So we know he's got one. We don't know what stage it is. We only want to know, did the stage worsen or is it a new pressure ulcer, right? So two weeks into the episode, it was debrided and observed as a, as a stage four pressure ulcer. That's considered your start of care assessment, <laughs> stage four. As soon as you can stage it, that's your first stage. And at discharge, it is a granulating stage four pressure ulcer. So the first thing we ask, does our patient has, have a state a pressure ulcer? Yes. yes, he does. Is it new? Is it a new pressure ulcer since the sock rock? No, it's not new. Now the next question is, is it worse? From the very first time you could stage it to date, is it worse? No. No. So... What are, how are we going to answer M1313? All zeros, right? Not new, not worse, all zeros. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah? Are we all good? <laughs> okay. If the pressure ulcer was unstageable at your sock rock, then was stageable on a routine visit and or follow-up assessment, and by discharge, the pressure ulcer had increased in numerical stage, then it did get worse. 
and then we're going to have to re report that one. Okay. So at the start of care, Mrs. Perkins had a pressure ulcer covered with a non-removable dressing. Two days into the episode, the dressing was removed and observed to be a stage three pressure ulcer. At discharge, it was observed to be a stage four pressure ulcer. So the first question we ask is, do we have a pressure ulcer? Yes, right? Is it new? Nope. But is it worse? Yes. So how are we going to answer this one? Does that look right? Zero, zero, one. We only have one current pressure ulcer that's a stage four, and that stage four is worse than what it, its previous stage was. Its previous stage was a three, so that's worse, so we have to say one stage four worsened. Are we all good? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If the previously stageable pressure ulcer becomes unstageable, then was deep breathed sufficiently to be able to be staged again by discharge, compare its stage before it was deemed unstageable to its stage at discharge. Okay. So at the start of care, Mr. Chase had a stage two pressure ulcer. The pressure ulcer was subsequently documented to be unstageable due to slop. At discharge, the pressure ulcer is a stage three. So first question, does he have a pressure ulcer? Yes. Okay, is it new? Nope, not new, right? Is it worse? Yes. Yes. So how will we answer this? How many stage twos? Zero. Zero. How many stage threes? One. One. And the zeros. Are we all good? Yes. Okay. Okay, M1313, worsening and pressure ulcer status since the sock rock. Pressure ulcers that are unstageable at discharge due to a dressing or device such as a cast that cannot be removed to assess the skin underneath cannot be reported as new or worse. So we get a score there. <laughs> Slap a wound back on there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Unless no pressure ulcer existed at that site at the most recent start of care, resumption of care. Okay. So at discharge, Mr. Beeson's pressure ulcer on his left ankle is covered with a non-removable dressing. At the start of care, the pressure ulcer was a stage two. So on M1313, we want to know, does our patient have a pressure ulcer? He does have a pressure ulcer, yes. Is it new? No, it's not new. Is it worse? We don't know. So unless we absolutely knew for sure it's worse because we can see it today, then we don't have to report it. Okay? So it's going to be all zeros. And stop me anytime if you'll have questions about any of these, okay? All right, that's pressure ulcers. Um, staging. So we're going to go into the status and stage of the most problematic pressure ulcer. And if I remember correctly, I have a couple of slides here that are not correct. So, um, Robin, if you could do me a favor and pull up an OASIS on in M1300s, I'll, I'll know it when I see it <laughs> because it's the same as the one before. Okay, so remember, no closed stage threes or four pressure ulcers are captured in this these items unless they have broken down and reopened. Okay, so M1320 wants to know the status of the most problematic pressure ulcer that is observable. This excludes pressure ulcers that cannot be observed due to non-removable dressings. So we want to know, is it newly epithelialized, fully granulating, early partial granulation, not healing, or non-observable? And we'll talk about how to define those in just a few slides. 1324 wants to know the stage of the most problematic unhealed pressure ulcer. And again, it has to be a pressure ulcer that you can stage. If it's covered in escar or, or a wound back or something of that nature, then we can't stage it. And we would um, have to answer NA. So it's either stage one, two, three, or four. Okay. So let's define status. What's considered newly epithelialized? 
And everything in this box must be true in order to say something is newly epithelialized. So your wound bed has to be completely covered with epithelium. There can't be any exudate, no avascular tissue such as slough or eschar, no signs or symptoms of infection. So if you can't say yes to all of that, that wound is not newly epithelialized and you want to move over to box uh, fully granulating, the next box over. And again, everything in this box has to be true in order to say it's fully granulating. So your wound bed has to be filled with granulation tissue to the level of surrounding skin or new epithelium. There cannot be any dead space. They cannot have any avascular tissue such as slough or eschar no signs or symptoms of infection, and the wound edges have to be open. They can't be curled under or macerated. You know, the white maceration you see sometimes, that can't be there in order to say it's fully granulating. If any of those aren't true, then you're going to move down to the next box, which is early partial granulation. And again, all of these have to be true in order to say that wound is early or partially granulating. So it has to have equal to or greater than 25% of the wound bed covered in granulation tissue. That means there has to be less than 25% of the wound bed covered in slough or ascar. There can't be any signs or symptoms of infection. And the wound edges, again, need to be opened up, okay? If not all of that is true, then your wound is not healing. And in this box, if anything in this box is true, then your answer is not healing. So equal to or greater than 25% of a vascular tissue, just for now, just keep it up, um, clean but non-granulating wound bed. So that just clean wound that's just not doing anything, that's not healing. Closed or hyperkeratonic wound edges, if there's any signs or symptoms of infection, or just a persistent failure to improve despite your comprehensive wound management. You're going to consider those types of wounds non-healing. Okay, so M1320, status of most problematic pressure ulcer that is observable. 1320 is your status. Remember, is it newly epithelialized, fully granulating, early partial granulation, not healing, or in a non-observable? So steps to accuracy. Step one, you're going to identify which pressure ulcer is observable. It's got to be a stage two or higher. And all observable unless covered by dressing, cast, or et cetera, that cannot be removed. So just because it's covered in escar and you can't stage it doesn't mean you can't see it. So every pressure ulcer would be considered observable unless there's a non-removable dressing on it. So that's the difference between status and stage. Okay. Um, and escar and slough don't impact this. And you have to determine what's the most problematic. That's totally a clinical judgment. You know, is it the location? Is it the size? Is it, you know, the one that just won't progress, you can't heal? You know, you're going to have to determine that. And we're going to apply our WLC and guidelines to determine the status. And those are the ones that we just went over in all the four boxes. So, again, newly epithelialized, that's completely covered, uh, regardless of how long it's been re-epithelialized. So this is not appropriate for stage two ulcers. Fully epithelialized stage two ulcers, stage two pressure ulcers are healed and not current pressure ulcers. So we're not going to ever use fully epithelialized or newly epithelialized. Um, only appropriate healing status for a stage two pressure ulcer is not healing. So if they have a stage two, it's not healing. They don't granulate, which is why they can't epithelialize, okay? The only appropriate healing stage for SDTI is not healing. And in a no observable pressure ulcer are covered by non-removable dressing changes. So if you have a stage 2 or deep tissue, it's not healing. So that makes those easy. Okay, so determine what is observable, and we went over that already. You know, anything that you can see that's not covered by uh, dressing is considered observable, okay? And then you're going to determine what is your uh, most problematic one. So if a patient has, has, a patient has a pressure ulcer that is totally covered with ASGAR, the status would be M1320, the status would be not healing, right? M1324, your stage would be in a non-observable. So it's just correlating 
to you that M1320 and M1324 could appear to be contradictory, but they're not. You know, you can have a status of not healing and a stage of non-observable and that be accurate. Because you can't stage a wound that, that's covered in NASCAR, but you can still see it. And so you know it's not healing. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Mrs. Roderick has two pressure ulcers. A stage three, which is 13 by 10, on her left trochanter that is fully granulating. She also has a 0.5 by 0.3 centimeter pressure ulcer on her left elbow that is 100% covered in slough. Treatment of the elbow ulcer has been extremely difficult as the patient constantly removes the dressing. So how would you answer M1324? Uh, what is the stage of your most problematic unhealed pressure ulcer? First, you have to define which one is your most problematic, right? So, so which of the two of those pressure ulcers do we think would be the most problematic? The one on the left trochanter or the one on the left elbow? Any, any guesses? Elbow. Elbow. Perfect. Okay. So that's our most problematic. So what is the stage? It's a little tricky one, isn't it? Not stageable. Exactly. So we're going to put NA in there because NA represents the patient has no pressure ulcer or no stageable pressure ulcer. So our most problematic pressure ulcer is going to be NA in 1324. What? My answer said three. Stage <laughs> three. Okay, so what did we do wrong here? Excludes pressure ulcers that cannot be staged. Okay, I'm so sorry. I think I just messed everybody up. Robin, why didn't you catch me? <laughs> okay, this, this is great learning. Okay, so this is why you have to read the whole question. Excludes pressure ulcers that cannot be staged due to non-removable dressing devices, coverage or wound bed by sloth and or escort or suspected deep tissue. So my bad. The most problematic we know is the elbow. However, that's that one is excluded in this question because we exclude those that can't be staged. So the answer is going to be three. Did I just confuse everybody? Can you read me what line that is covering? I don't know what slide that. Oh, okay, I see. This is Roderick has two pressure ulcers, a stage three, 13 by 10, on her left trochanter that is fully granulating. She also has a 0.5 by 0.3 pressure ulcer on her left elbow that is 100% covered in slough. Okay. Treatment of the elbow ulcer has been extremely difficult as the patient constantly removes the dressing. So we need better pronounce on those. Okay, so I messed that up. Exactly. And this question excludes those types of wounds. Okay. So I hope I didn't confuse you guys too much. Okay, remember, no closed stage threes or four pressure ulcers are captured in these items unless they are broken down and reopened. Okay. Moving on to stasis ulcers. So any questions about pressure ulcers before we move on? Are your heads spinning? <laughs> Mine is a little bit. <laughs> okay, stasis ulcers. Does this patient have a stasis ulcer? So our, we have three options, or four options actually. Zero is no. One is yes. They have one of each, an observable and an unobservable stasis ulcer. Three is yes, the patient has observable stasis ulcers only. That's two. Three is yes, patient has unobservable stasis ulcers only. Known but not observable due to non-removable dressing or device. Report only current stasis ulcers, not <laughs> arterial lesions or ulcers. If completely epithelialized, no long, it's not considered a stasis ulcer. If all stasis ulcers are completely epithelialized, then you're going to answer zero, no, and skip to surgical wounds. 
So then it goes back to your status of your most problematic stasis ulcer. Uh, we do not have newly epithelialized because that's not an option for your stasis ulcer. So your options are fully granulated, early partial granulation, or not healing. And you would go back to those boxes to determine which one that is. And now do those, when we talk about stasis ulcers, do those have to be documented by a physician that those are stasis ulcers? Yeah, the physicians have to um, diagnose, yes. And, and if we need to get clarification, then we do that, right? Okay, surgical wounds. Does the patient have a surgical wound? Um, this kind of seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? No or yes, the patient has at least one observable surgical wound or two surgical wounds known but not observable due to non-removable dressing. The, um, the caveat with surgical wounds is, is interesting because not everything we as clinicians consider surgical wounds are surgical wounds. And the other thing to consider in answering M1340 is your time frame. You know, so if they had a true surgery like a, a joint surgery, but it's greater than 30 days old, then we would not count this as a, a surgical wound. However, if it was 28 days old, 29 days old, and it looks great, it looks healed, and you're thinking, you know, there's no point in counting it, it looks like a scar to me, it still would be counted. So anything 30 days or younger, would be counted. And then we're going to, you, you would say, yes, patient has at least one observable surgical wound. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So in 1304, does the patient have a surgical wound? Well, in order to answer this question, you have to know what a surgical wound is according to OASIS, not according to um, your clinical minds. So mm -hmm. let's go into this a little bit. Don't try to apply clinical logic here because it's just going to frustrate you. <laughs> All you need to try to do is just learn what they're telling you is a surgical wound for Oasis and what is not. And, and I want to remind you, I want to take you back to the beginning of the presentation that it, this is data collection. So in hopes to decrease some of your anxiety as we go through this, anything that is not here and is not considered a surgical wound, most likely will be captured in a very specific question related to that. So it's not that it's, quote, not a surgical wound. It's that their data collection is set up in a way to capture things in bulk and capture things in specific items. So some things are very specific questions, and it wouldn't be considered a surgical wound because they're going to get that information later. Okay? So common denominators. What is not a surgical wound for the purpose of this question? So if it involves the integumentary system, such as your mucous membranes, cataracts, or surgeries that are performed vaginally, they would not be considered a surgical wound. All ostomies are excluded. Trachs, um, thoracostomies, cystostomies, ileostomies, colostomies, all of them are not considered surgical wounds. Um, and as we go through here, and we're talking about what is and what isn't a surgical wound, and there are a few things that kind of just fall through the grouping and fall through specific items. And any of those are going to go into M1350. So if it's not a surgical wound and there's not a specific question about it, then you're going to capture it in M1350 most likely. What about if it's a neoplastic? Not a surgical one. No. Nope. And you know why? Yep. <laughs> there's a specific question about it. OK, so remember, it's data collection. So there are certain things that they want to track specifically. They don't want it grouped together in surgical wounds. So they pull those out and they don't want you double answering. OK, so there are specific questions about ostomies. OK, also incisions created to perform exploratory surgery incidentally used by surgeons when closing to in closing to insert chest tubes are not considered surgical wounds. Common denominator still, what is not a surgical wound? Pick lines are not surgical wounds. External devices, infusion meds via sub-Q needle are not a surgical wound once the incision created to implant the device is healed. IND of, of an abscess is not considered a surgical wound unless it goes beyond that. Like if they start removing mesh and structures and things like that, then it would be. But your simple INDs are not surgical wounds. If the procedure results in a puncture site, 
unless it involves a balloon, it's not considered a surgical balloon. So think about your cardiac cast, your paracentesis, those types of procedures would not be considered, considered surgical wounds. Um, so when does the puncture site get considered? When an implanted device is accessed or recently deaccessed, the puncture site is assessed to determine healing status. Okay. Presence of sutures do not equal a surgical wound. We know we suture a lot of things. You know, we suture IVs, we suture ostomies. Sometimes they may even suture a pressure ulcer closed, but that's still a pressure ulcer. It does not become a surgical wound. Remember, the only time our pressure ulcers become surgical wounds is if they're grafts or flaps, not sutured. Uh, traumatic lacerations sutured by a plastic surgeon would not be considered a surgical wound. Fistula is complicated of surgery, but is not a surgical wound. Removal or excision of a toenail is not a surgical wound. So if the surgical procedure was performed beyond simple incision, then it would be, you know, so if they start amputating some toe there, then it would be. Okay, so those are the, those are the things that we would not consider surgical wounds. Here are some of the things that we do consider surgical wounds. An orthopedic pin site. Every site where the pin comes out is a surgical wound. Peritoneal, peritoneal dialysis catheter, a shave, pump, or excisional biopsy, skin graft and donor site, but not the grafted, not the grafted burn, incision site of a mammocyte. Those are all surgical wounds. LVD exit site is a surgical wound, and it's always going to be considered not healing. Now we talked about ostomies a little bit earlier, how they're not surgical wounds. Here's the exception: if you take down the ostomy then that will be a surgical wound because they no longer have an ostomy, so it's not going to be captured in that question. So now you would capture it under surgical wounds. Wounds with drains are surgical wounds, even after the drain is removed, but not ostomies. And your central lines are surgical wounds. So that's why you have your portacast, and everybody kind of gets freaked out. Why are my coders telling me my portacast is a surgical wound? This is why it's a central line. It's forever a surgical wound. Okay, so your implanted infusion, implanted venous access, portacast, many boards, um, your shunt, your grafts, all of those are considered current surgical wounds as long as the device is in place, even if it's not accessed. Just as long as they have it, it is considered a surgical wound. If you get a, a tendon repaired, a, a ruptured organ, traumatic surgery, um, or procedure reser resulting in a surgical incision, you know, your total knees, your cut downs, your things like that, those are all surgical wounds. Okay, so your status of your most problematic surgical wound, we're going to go back to those four boxes. It's either newly epithelialized, fully granulating, early partial granulating, or not healing. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do is identify which surgical wounds are observable. And all of them should be unless they have a dressing in place. Now, you, you need to know your dressings also because you have some dressings that are designed to be lifted up and you can look at that surgical wound. We want to assess it if we can. So even if they say don't change the dressing, if it's like a mepilex or something like that, it's designed to be lifted and viewed and put back down. And I encourage you to go ahead and do that. That way you can assess the wound. But if it's truly something you cannot take off, then um, we, it's going to be, you know, we're not going to be able to answer this one here. Um, so that goes for your, your ortho patients with the knees as well. We can still pull that back and assess that um, incision line and then recover it with the same dressing. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> okay. Step two, determine most problematic. Again, this is your judgment call. What's the largest resistance to treatment? most problematic observable surgical wound. Okay, and you're going to apply your WOCN guidance to determine your status. Healed, when closed by primary intention. So you have sutures, staples, or bonding. That's considered primary intention. And it's considered a surgical wound for 30 days. Okay, so that's what we talked about. If it's day 9, day 30, you still have a surgical wound. No matter how much it looks like a scar, it's still documented as a surgical wound. 
Date of complete epithelialization unknown. Uh, just, just go back to the surgery. When did they have the surgery? And that's we're going to go from that date. Okay. So is the incision healing by primary or secondary int intention? So the first, we have some boxes here. The first thing we're going to look at is there are no open openings or di disruptions in the incision. So the wound is healing by primary intention and can only have the status of non-healing or newly epithelialized. Incisions healing by primary intention do not heal by granulation. They're closed, right? Step two, is the incision line completely re-epithelialized with no signs or symptoms of infection? If completely closed, re-epithelialization generally recurs in occurs within three days. So if the answer to that is yes, you have a closed wound, there's no signs of infection, then you're going to score that status as newly epithelialized. Okay, so if there is some um, drainage, you know, and it's not completely closed, maybe there's a little bit of an open area there, then it's going to be not healing. There's nothing in between when we determine that it's healing by primary intention. Does that make sense? Because primary intention isn't isn't going to be granulating from the wound bed up. So it's either going to be newly epithelialized or not healing. Not healing means you have an opening or some drainage. Now, be careful not to just automatically score a scab as not healing because a, a scab could be like serous drainage that attached to the suture line or the staple or something that can just easily be washed off. If it has a scab that truly adheres to the incision, and not, you know, the structures outside of that, then it would be not healing. So when you clean it is when you're going to know if that's if that's really a scab that's attached to that incision. OK, so primary intention, it means it's closed there and by sutures, staples or bonding. Right. So we either have newly epithelialized. It's perfect. It looks great or not healing. Nothing in between. So if there's openings or disruptions present in the incision line, the wound is healing by secondary intention and have the status of non-healing, early partial granulation, or newly epithelialized. And we talked about scabs. Okay, so impact the impact of sutures and staples. Opening in the skin adjacent to the incision line caused by removal of staples or sutures not considered part of a surgical wound when determining healing status. Okay, so what's that, what that says is that if you have sutures or if you have staples and when where they go into the skin is not going to be part of your assessment when you're assessing your incision. So you're only looking at the incision. So if you have an infection in your staple where your insertion side of your staple or your suture, that assessment or infection does not impact your status of your surgical wound. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, determine not healing, only selected if wound excluding staple suture sites meets WLCM description. Okay. Implanted venous access devices and infusion devices. So once the insertion site is healed, score status is newly epithelialized as long as it is, as it is implanted, unless it deteriorates. So your port cath patients, right? They're always going to have a surgical wound, and it's most likely always going to be newly epithelialized. When the needle access is always in place, then it's going to be non-healing. So if you're going out there and you're infusing something via port cath at your start of care, they're going to have a surgical wound that's not healing. Kind of makes sense. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not not healing in our minds, but because we have something infusion fusing through that, then it's not healing. Status of a surgical wound when taking antibiotics for a surgical site infection. So again, just because they're on antibiotics doesn't mean they have an infected wound, right? We all know that that could be prophylactic. So you're going to assess the wound itself, not not based on their antibiotic use or lack of. Surgical wounds. Any questions about surgical wounds? Feels like we went through that fast. Okay. M1350. This is your catch-all box. This is skin lesions or open wounds. Does the patient have a skin lesion or open wound excluding bowel or ostomy 
other than those described above that is receiving intervention by the home health agency. So what could go here? So what are things that we have not talked about? Well, we haven't talked much about peripheral IV sites, right? Those could go here. Um, what about non-bowel ostomies? There's not a specific question. And remember, we said no ostomy is a surgical wound. So those would go here. Uh, thoracostomies, your tracheostomies, those would go here, right? We had specific wounds. We had a lot of specific wounds, but there's a couple of specific wounds that we see frequently that are very significant. And, it, and it's interesting to me that they're not captured anywhere specifically. Those are your diabetic ulcers and your arterial ulcers. Those would go here, right? Edema. edema. If we're if we're making interventions related to edema, definitely that would go here. Can we think of anything else? I think we kind of covered it all. Pick lines, those would go here. Your pegs, your pegs. Mm -hmm, yeah, your pegs, your super pubics, yeah. those would go here. Yeah, anything else that was not addressed in a previous Oasis item and all bowel ostomies are excluded from here. But anything else would come in here. Okay. You admitted a 99-year-old female patient to service following a mastectomy. She grimaced as you lifted her blouse to assess the suture lines. You discovered the incision lines were completely closed, clean, dry, and intact without signs or symptoms of infection, but two of the suture entry sites were inflamed and painful. So M1350, how are we gonna answer this one? Does the patient have a skin lesion or open wound, excluding bowel ostomy, other than those described above, that is receiving intervention by the home health agency? No or yes? That's exactly right. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So your your infection related to the suture sites is what we're going to capture here, right? Because that's not going to go with the incision. That's separate. So it's yes, it is kind of a trick question, but that's where you're going to capture that. Is yeah, because there's no other question. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that would have been wrong. <laughs> so does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, I yeah. Okay, and sometimes they're so close it would be hard to tell. Yeah, but if you can tell, if it's distinctly different, you know. Okay, so that's a yes. Mr. Frederick had a right TKR on 10 10 16. His incision line is fully approximated, no exudate, no avascular tissue, and no signs or symptoms of infection. The PT performed the discharge oasis on 11 3 16. What is the correct answer? M 1340. Does the patient have a surgical wound? Yes. And why? Why does the patient have a surgical wound? Because the incision from the knee is less than 38 old. Perfect. Okay. So Holly said yes, the patient has a surgical wound because the incision, although it's healed and looks fantastic, it is less than 30 days old, so we still capture it. So what is the status of that wound in 1342? Zero newly epithelialized, one fully granulating, two early partial, or three non-healing? Perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, OASIS C2 changed from N1500 to M1501. So this is a discharge, and the question is 1501, symptoms and heart failure. So we're out of wounds at this point, and let's take a 15-minute break and meet back. Uh, well, you know what? Why don't we take an hour break, and we can have lunch. It's 1130, and we can meet back at 1230. Does that work for everybody's schedule?